episode 24. God bless you. Welcome back to Bible FAQ with Kirk Van. I am Kirk Van Odeham, your host for the podcast that provides brief, thoughtful, biblical answers to your questions. And I so appreciate each one of you that is tuning in today and to all the different episodes that we've had up to this point. But I want to express a special uh, welcome to our friends who are joining us from Discipleship Central from this episode. And uh, hope you enjoy what you hear. No matter how long you've been listening or how you found us, we're just glad that each and every one of you has joined us here today. Just a moment, I'll be uh, addressing a question that was submitted regarding the topic of speaking in tongues, which is a very hot and popular topic. A uh, previous episode that we have done on this topic, uh, not the exact same topic, but a, a related topic as the most popular episode we've had. Uh, so I suspect that people will be interested in this as well. But before we get to that, as always, I want to either uh, inform or remind uh, our listeners that Bible FAQ with Kirk Van is available in a variety of different formats and a variety of different ways to access it. Uh, first and foremost, it is an audio podcast, and as such, it is available in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Stitcher, and many, many other uh, apps and services. And so to find out more about that, go to our website, which is kirkvan.com. And there you can find out about all the different ways that you can access this content. Or if you prefer, as many do, uh, to watch the video of the podcast being recorded. Uh, if you're really a glutton for punishment and really want to see this face that's made for radio, uh, you can tune in on our Facebook watch. Uh, in our Facebook pages at Bible FAQ with Kirk Van. We also have a YouTube channel, and you can get the link to that from our website as well, kirkvan.com. If you would like to submit a question to be addressed on a future episode, we certainly invite and encourage you to do so. Again, visit the website, kirkvan.com. You can submit a question through the website. You can do so on our Facebook page as a private message, or you can even email us and direct that email to the address ask at kirkvan.com. Well, let's get right into the question that we're going to address uh, for today's episode. So I received this question from an uh, individual named Mike, and Mike is from Parts Unknown, evidently, as he didn't uh, communicate where he's from. So Mike from Parts Unknown uh, contacted us via the website, and I'll just go ahead and read the whole question. It's a little lengthy, uh, but it helps to set the uh, context of the question uh, by reading it in its entirety in this case. And Mike writes, I am curious about what you think of this. I was listening to a radio program recently, and the host was answering a question about speaking with tongues. The question was basically about whether or not tongues are meant for today. In answering the question, he said that tongues are not for today, but he also said that the, or that the people who say they speak in tongues today don't even do it in the same way as the believers in Acts chapter 2. His point was basically that in Acts 2, those who spoke in tongues spoke in other human languages understood by those who witnessed what was happening, and that the purpose was for the transmission of the gospel. He went on to explain that this was a unique event for the founding of the church to help the message spread quickly to various parts of the world. By contrast, he said people who claim to speak in tongues today are not speaking actual languages, but are simply speaking gibberish. How do you respond to this view? Well, thank you for submitting the question, and it certainly is something, uh, objections that we have heard before about those who object to the practice and the uh, biblical expression of speaking in tongues. And, you know, I don't want, I want to be uh, derogatory or mean to other people's views, but certainly a lot of bias implicit in these types of comments and statements, uh, not having heard the, the complete um, 
the complete argument that this radio host has. So there's a lot here, but I'll, I'll try to respond to the main points. First, I do want to point out that I did a full episode on the topic of speaking in tongues as the initial sign of spirit baptism several weeks ago, and that was episode number 13 episode 13. So I'm not going to repeat uh, hardly any of what I said in that episode, uh, but if you're interested in a more comprehensive look uh, at that topic, check out episode number 13. In that episode, I covered uh, several objections that some people have to the practice of speaking in tongues in general and as a sign of the Spirit. So you may be interested in checking that out. Uh, and again, you can do that through all the various means I described. Check out our website, kirkvan.com, for more information on accessing the various podcast episodes. So to address the specific points in this question about this radio host, well, the first point uh, will be about the view that speaking in tongues is not for today. And I, I did cover this in more detail in episode 13, uh, and so I'm not going to repeat everything, uh, but this is this is part of what's called the cessationist view. A cessationist me just means that they believe tongues have ceased, that they're no longer for today. And again, I'm not going to reiterate everything, but a popular proof text for this is found in 1 Corinthians 13. And verses 8 through 10 say this. I'll read the English Standard Version. It says, Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So according to the verse of Scripture, they believe uh, that the spiritual gifts have such as prophecies and others, have passed away and the tongues have ceased. And they've really focused in on verse 10. It says, but that which, when that which is perfect comes, the partial will pass away. So the question really is not if tongues will cease, but when. I think everyone who reads this agrees that tongues and other spiritual gifts will cease. But the cessationists have created their own endpoint, their own termination point, if you will. And they usually identify that as something like the passing of the apostles and or the completion of the New Testament canon. In other words, once the apostles' work was finished and the New T Testament uh, was complete in the form that we have it, uh, then th that was the perfection that verse 10 is referring to according to their view. And therefore, these supernatural gifts, tongues and others, were no longer needed and passed away. But the only point I'll make about that, again, I go into more details in the other episode 13, uh, but the only point I'll make is there's no biblical evidence for the conclusion that they reach. We all agree that tongues and other spiritual gifts will pass away, but when? And there's no reason to specifically believe that is upon the completion of the New Testament canon. There's no language to indicate that. That's just an assumption and, and conjecture that one makes and provides to the te text, an eisegesis, if you will, as opposed to exegesis, reading what the text says. The fact of the matter is that Paul himself clearly indicates the point at which spiritual gifts will come to an end. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, so the very first chapter is part of the introduction uh, to this letter or epistle to, to the Corinthians. Uh, he's greeting them. He says, I give thanks to God for you because of the grace of God that was given unto you, uh, given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. And then in verse number seven, it says this, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking about not lacking in any gift. In the context of 1 Corinthians, we can uh, safely connect this with the spiritual gifts, which is a repeated theme throughout. And w when are they to continue seeking and, uh, and, and following after these gifts? Uh, what point are they to stop? Uh, it says here in verse number 7, uh, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, certainly refers to the second coming. If that's not clear enough, it says, who will sustain you to the end guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
that phrase, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, is, is replete in the New Testament as referring to the second coming. So the church is to, to follow after the gifts, to seek the best gifts, as Paul describes later in the, in the, in the epistle. Uh, and that's until uh, Jesus Christ himself comes back. So you have to understand that biblically, uh, the, the theological uh, takeaway from what the Bible describes is that we are living today in the era or the period or the age uh, that's often called the church age. So this is basically the era of the New Testament or the New Covenant. Some people like the word to describe dispensation. Uh, so the dispensation of the church age, or sometimes it's called other things. But the main point here is this, the church age or whatever you wanna call it, describe it at, it began at Pentecost and it will continue until the second coming of Jesus Christ. And there's no, there's really no biblical rationale for dividing uh, this age or this era or this period into smaller, uh, I guess, mini ages or something like that, such as when the apostles lived and then after the apostles lived. I mean, I guess historically we can divide it into periods uh, just to you know break things up, but there's no reason to believe that God deals with the church in a significantly different way throughout the entire church age that begins at Pentecost and ends at the second coming. And even Peter's uh, speech, sermon in Acts chapter 2, describes how uh, that that the, the the church that was being born and, and what was happening at that day would continue uh, until the very end of the second coming. There's lots of language and verbiage to describe that. And not only um, not only did the gifts continue until that time and gifts meant for this whole era, uh, but after the church age is complete and the consummation of the age, there's other things that will change, including the mediatorial role of Jesus Christ himself. Uh, the Bible called the, the, the age of the sonship or the, the purpose of the sonship, if you will. And not just uh, cessation of tongues, but all spiritual gifts. And in fact, the outpouring of the spirit itself will no longer need to take place because at the consummation of the age, all those who are a part of the kingdom had been filled with the spirit. So uh, this is just uh, a misunderstanding and a misinterpretation uh, of what scripture is talking about. There is no reason to believe that the spiritual gifts, including tongues, have ended or will end until the end of the church age at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so the second point then, uh, the first point uh, that speaking in tongues was not for today, which is clearly not the case. The second point that the radio host also seems to believe that he has additional evidence for his cessationist viewpoint of tongues. Namely, uh, his idea is that tongues had a specific purpose uh, in Acts 2 that expired. And also he claims that uh, Pentecostals today, those who speak in tongues today, have a different expression or manifestation than what was evident in the book of Acts, specifically in Acts chapter number two, from what I understand about this question. So there's two things here, really. First, that the purpose of tongues uh, was for uh, a missionary uh, transmission or spread of the gospel, a kind of shortcut or jumpstart, if you will, that was exclusive to the founding of the church and not to be utilized after that point. And then the second kind of inherent point in this is this idea of the expression or manifestation of tongues was speaking in foreign human languages unknown to the speaker. And they would say Pentecostals don't do that today, or at least not that's not the typical expression. So it's different in that and that we're not doing the same thing that they did. If again, if I understand uh, this and if I'm summarizing this radio host's view properly. So let me address these one at a time. First, the idea that the purpose of speaking in tongues was specifically for the transmission of the gospel into other languages. I've, I've heard this argument before, and, and, and we can, uh, here's, here's what it says in Acts chapter number two. Of course, in verse four, it tells us they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So that's the miracle, that's the precedent. And then a few verses later in, in verse six, it says, 
says, Now when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. A couple verses later, verse 8, And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. So there's an assumption made here that the, that the, the speaking in tongues was actually speaking in foreign languages and it was heard as such by all the people who were there at that time. Even if this were true in Acts chapter 2, uh, even if that was the case, that they were speaking in these foreign languages that were known and understood by all these pilgrims who had come to the Feast of Pentecost, um, and we have to understand that the Feast of Pentecost was, was a feast that uh, it was required for all capable, financially able, uh, uh, observant Jews to present themselves in Jerusalem. So there would have been Jews from all around the world. Uh, so the idea is that the apostles spoke in these different foreign languages. And I don't know how exactly we'd rectify that. There was 120 people that initially, give or take, you know, approximately 120 people that upon whom the Spirit initially fell. And there was, you know, uh, thousands of people that were there. So did like six or seven of them speak in, you know, the, the Bible says there's about 14 or 15 different uh, groups or nationalities represented. So did six or seven speak in Egyptian and six or, se six or seven speak in uh, Greek and six and seven, six or seven speak in something else. Uh, so the all 14, that seems like it would be chaotic. But even if that were the case, even if that's what happened, that they specifically spoke in these human foreign languages on the day of Pentecost, that does not take into account the other incidents of speaking in tongues as the Holy Spirit is poured out in other passages in the book of Acts. Speaking of Acts chapter number 8, the Samaritans, Acts chapter number 10, the Gentiles, Acts chapter number 19, uh, these disciples of Jesus in Ephesus, they all spoke with tongues as they received the Holy Spirit, but there's no indication that they were speaking other languages that were intelligible to other onlookers. Uh, so it doesn't take those passages into account. So perhaps there was a different expression and manifestation for those. And as I mentioned, there's also an assumption in this understanding that these Jewish pilgrims in Acts chapter 2 were not able to understand the apostles in any other way, and therefore they needed to hear them in their own native languages. But both the context of the passage and what is known about history contradict this assumption. Number one, uh, as the, after the crowd gathered together after this initial outpouring of the Spirit, uh, they all had the same question in mind, which is recorded in verse chapter or chapter number two, verse twelve. Uh, what does this mean, or what meaneth this in the King James version? And then what happened? Peter addressed the entire crowd, and there's no indication here when Peter is addressing the entire crowd of all these thousands of people from these Jews from all around the the uh, Western world, if you would if you will, or all around the Mediterranean world and that, that of the Persian and uh, Assyrian uh, remnants of that empire from the east, all these Jews that were gathered together, there's no indication that Peter had to speak in different languages or that he continued to speak in foreign tongues, foreign languages miraculously, or that there was interpreters involved so all the different people could hear and understand. It seems the natural reading is simply that all the people understood whatever language Peter was speaking in. They spoke in one language that could be understood by all. And it's certainly most likely that all of these uh, people that were gathered, they were all observant Jews. After all, they were there to celebrate this Jewish feast and festival. So they were uh, observant uh, Jews who would have probably had a functional understanding of Hebrew, the language of the Torah and the Old Testament. In fact, uh, they probably learned such from the youngest of age. Now, that doesn't mean it was their native language or the common colloquial tongue that each of them spoke, but they would have also they would have some level of functional proficiency in Hebrew. There's other theories as to what language P Peter possibly could have been delivering the message of Pentecost, if not Hebrew, perhaps Greek or Aramaic. But whatever it was, it was a language that was understood by everyone. And so the idea that there had to be this transmission process of the gospel to kickstart the church because of all this diversity of languages is simply not the case historically 
or in the context of what we read in Acts chapter number two. And then on a related point, there's no indication that the apostles and disciples who were initially filled with the Spirit, that first 120 or so, as they were speaking in tongues, there's no indication that they were addressing any other people. From the context of the text itself, they were not preaching or teaching that we can discern what were they doing and what were they saying as they spoke in tongues. It appears that they were praying, and in their prayers they were praising and magnifying God. And that's evident from verse 11, uh, the response of those who, who heard what was going on. Uh, they said, the CSB says, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God. The NIV says, we hear them declaring the wonders of God. And so, you know, we know from Acts chapter number one that it was their custom to gather together in this place and pray. And that's what they appear to have been doing, praying. And so as they were praying, the Spirit fell and the, as they continued to pray, just as we experience today. Um, and so um, this is also reminiscent, by the way, of Acts chapter number 10, when the Holy Spirit fell upon uh, the Gentiles and Peter and some other Jews were there to observe what was going on. Uh, we know from Acts chapter number 10, verses 45 and 46, that the Jews understood beyond a doubt what was taking place, that the Gentiles were uh, having on them poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, because verse number 46 says, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Uh, as other translations say, for we, they heard them speak in other tongues, declaring the greatness of God. They heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Uh, and then uh, even more so, Peter's description of this event of the Gentiles receiving the Holy Ghost, he tells in Acts chapter 11, uh, verses 15 through 17, he tells the other leaders and apostles in Jerusalem that the Holy Ghost came down on them just as on us at the beginning. And in verse 17, if then God gave to them the same gift that he also gave to us, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So there was something very familiar about this to Peter because he ex described it and explained that it was the exact same expression and manifestation that they had. And this would actually have been 10 years prior. And so the idea that the Gentiles were speaking in other languages that were un other heard to other people, there was no other people to witness to. There was no other people uh, that spoke other languages nearby. Uh, the idea is then not necessarily, and, and the reason I point all this out is not to make a case that they were not speaking in other languages intelligible to men. That's not the point. The point is that there's more than one way to look at this. Uh, and, uh, and that kind of uh, brings us a great segue into the second idea advanced by the radio hosts. And that, that idea is in Acts chapter 2. Their expression of speaking tongues was expressively and only speaking in human foreign languages. And as I mentioned, there's one of two possibilities here in Acts chapter number two. One is that they did, in fact, speak in other human foreign languages, some in Egyptian, some in Greek, some in whatever, um, you know, for the 14 or 15 groups that were represented there. Um, and... Uh, but the other alternative and the other possibility is that they were not actually speaking in foreign languages, but that they were speaking in unknown, unintelligible sounds or words, uh, and that the pilgrim Jews heard or understood them in their own language. And again, Acts chapter 2 and 6, when it was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? In, in other words, or to emphasize, and how hear we every man in Acts chapter 2 and verse 8. So the idea, and again, I'm just floating this as a possibility, is that they were speaking in tongues the same way Pentecostals do today in unintelligible words and sounds. We'll explain what that could be here in just a moment. But part of the miracle was not just that they were speaking in this unknown, unintelligible tongue, which is a miracle in and of itself, but there was a twofold miracle in that the people that were there on that occasion 
understood it in their own languages. They were understanding these praises that were going forth to God. They could make sense of it because God had opened their ears and their understanding to hear it. Now, if the first case is correct, that they were speaking human languages, then it's difficult to understand Peter's description of the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, as we said, because they had the same experience. Uh, so to me, that at least casts doubt on it, and it gives us different possibilities of what could have taken place. In any case, Paul did articulate that at minimum, not all instances of speaking in tongues involve speaking in known human languages. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and 1, Paul writes, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. The CSB puts it this way, If I speak in human or angelic tongues. So we know from other ancient Jewish literature that the Jews of this era and this period had a widespread understanding and belief uh, of divine or angelic tongues or languages. For example, the apocryphal book of the Testament of Job describes uh, angelic languages and the language of the divine. Uh, there's all kinds of rabbinical literature about Genesis and what language uh, God possibly spoke to Adam in the beginning before any human languages were developed. So there's all these different Jewish beliefs that were abounding. Now, I'm not saying exactly what the Apostle Paul knew or understand to be the truth of such things. I'm just saying it's not an odd understanding. It's not unknown to the, the people that these different kinds of things existed. And even outside of the Jewish uh, religion and culture, other ancient cultures had similar beliefs and also had various practices of ecstatic speech of one sort or another. Again, I'm not taking making the case for the veracity or the truthfulness or the spiritual quality of these other practices. I'm just saying they were not unknown and unheard of at this time. And so some scholars even differentiate between the practice or the concept of glossolalia, which is kind of the Greek for which means speaking in tongues, and this other word that was kind of made up to describe another concept, xenoglossa, which just literally means foreign tongues. In other words, they understand uh, in history and antiquity that there was two different divergent practices. One was speaking in uh, other foreign tongues, other foreign languages, and another was speaking in just a divine language is known as speaking in tongues uh, that was not actual languages but was a divine angelic language, if you will. At any rate, whatever the case may have been, Paul definitely makes a distinction between language that's intelligible to humans and language that is not. Now, please understand, again, I'm not trying to make a strong case one way or the other regarding Acts 2. I'm not saying that they did not speak in other human known languages. Uh, I'm saying we don't know for sure, and there's two possibilities here. Uh, in any event, Pentecostals who speak in tongues today, even if it is not in a known language, which is typically the case, uh, they are on a strong biblical foundation either way. Uh, whatever happened in Acts chapter number two, we know that there was different manifestation, manifestations of speaking in tongues in the Bible, and Paul uh, speaks to such. And the only other response that I'll make, and I cannot speak for this radio host, I, I don't know what his beliefs are, but it sounds like this radio host holds uh, the view that the only valid or biblical expression or experience of speaking in tongues is actually speaking in human foreign languages that the speaker does not know. In other words, if we were really speaking in tongues today, we'd be speaking in German or French or Chinese or Russian or something, and not in unintelligible unknown sounds or, or, or words that are not known. Uh, but this is simply not the case biblically, that that's the only valid expression. As I already discussed, Paul was drawing the distinction between human tongues, human languages, and angelic tongues or angelic languages. And I explained a little bit about that. But in addition to that, that's not even the strongest argument. In addition to that, Paul clearly points out in 1 Corinthians 14 that there is a difference between speaking in tongues as part of the as part of our prayer and communion with God in a way that we don't understand, that only God understands, 
and as a part of the operation of speaking in the prophetic spiritual gifts. Now, it's critical to understand the context of 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is the, the, the theme or the motif here. What's being discussed is the operation of spiritual gifts within public worship. So what's not being discussed here is the new birth experience and conversion and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. That's not what's being discussed in 1 Corinthians 4, 12 through 14. Private devotion and person, personal prayer and communication to God through intercession of the Spirit is not what's being discussed here. It's alluded to briefly as a point of comparison and distinction, but that's not what's being discussed here. So even though Paul was talking about the use of, and even more so the abuse of spiritual gifts in public worship, he nonetheless pointed out the distinction uh, of another legitimate and well-known use of speaking in tongues, and that is private devotion and prayer. And he says many things about this. He says in this use, in verse 2, for example, this use of tongues and private devotion, he says uh, it's not for speaking to people, but for speaking to God who speaks mysteries in the Spirit. And explains that we don't that we don't understand what it means, but we're praying to God. Verse four talks about the person who prays in this way, who prays in tongues through the Spirit, builds himself up or edifies himself. Some translations say, even though we don't know what it means, there is a spiritual work that's taking place that helps us to grow and develop and builds up our faith and encourages us. Uh, in verse fourteen, he says, "If I pray." In another tongue, my spirit prays. So the language could not be any clearer here. He's talking about, in some cases, speaking in tongues is a form of prayer to God. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the spirit praying when we pray, uh, our spirit praying and the spirit of God praying through us. In verse 15, he says, I will pray in the spirit and I will pray with understanding. I will sing in the spirit and I will sing in understanding. In other words, uh, he's saying I will pray through the spirit in tongues, but I also pray in my own language in the word with the words I choose with understanding and the same as in singing. So again, this private practice of prayer, not intelligible to us, not something we understand, not even a human language it can be comprehended, but praying through the spirit. Verse 16 talks about praising in the spirit again an illusion of speaking in tongues through private devotion and communication to god verse 17 talks about giving thanks in the spirit again in context talking about speaking in tongues in prayer to god verse 28 again differentiates between a public message in tongues and speaking to god in tongues through prayer and so we understand that there, uh, there's this whole phenomenon of speaking in tongues that is, is prayer. Some people call it prayer language, angelic language, heavenly language, different things, different ways people describe it. Paul talks, he calls it praying in the spirit, uh, praying in the spirit. And he is specifically in the context of speaking in tongues and the distinction of two different purposes or uses for tongues. And it's in this way, it's in this private devotion and communion with God in prayer that Paul makes statements such as in verse 5, I wish you all spoke with other tongues. Or in verse 18, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Or verse 39, do not forbid to speak, speak in tongues. In other words, he didn't want to be misunderstood because the main point of these, this chapter 14 that I am not talking about and I haven't been describing here. I was talking about the exceptions, the distinctions he was making. The main point of the chapter is that people were abusing uh, the spiritual uh, prophetic speaking gift of tongues and they were doing it out of order and they were doing it too much and it was not edifying the church. It was causing chaos and, and frustration. So he was trying to rein that in a little bit and say, don't do that so much, instead prophesy. But then he didn't want to be misunderstood. So he, he would make sure that they understood. But when it comes to personal prayer, when it comes to private devotion, when it comes to speaking to God and not being used in public worship, then I wish you all spoke with tongues. And I'm glad I speak with tongues more than anyone else. And I want to make it clear, don't stop people from speaking in tongues in that uh, aspect or in that manner. Uh, it's only the public uh, prophetic gift of tongues that was the problem that he was addressing.
And then there's also another passage in the New Testament that many believe describes a person praying in or through the Spirit and experiencing uh, tongues. And that's in Romans 8, verses 26 through 27. The King James says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself make it intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So this definitely is talking about the Spirit making intercession for us. And then there's this phrase about groanings which cannot be uttered, which some people uh, believe when you take that with the other biblical information and evidence and description of speaking in tongues, they make a parallel uh, to the reference. Now, I can't say conclusively that this passage is describing tongues. I think it's possible. In fact, I think it's the most probable explanation. Nevertheless, whatever, if it is or it's not, Paul is definitely talking about praying in or through the Spirit and the Spirit making intercession for us. And in a way that we don't understand, it seems to be the case. And that's certainly reminiscent of Paul's descriptions of praying in or through the Spirit uh, by virtue of speaking in tongues and in prayer in 1 Corinthians 14. So let me make sort of an overarching point here. Uh, to try to, to, to pull this all together. Many who are critical of tongues, who are biased against it, who try to steer people away from the practice and, and tell us as, you know various things, negative things about it, they like to characterize speaking in tongues and confine it to a specific short-term limited practice for a very particular narrow purpose and, and, and even that practice and purpose is now expired, they'd say. And I've kind of talked about all of that. But biblically, biblically, we can identify quite a few expressions of tongues and potential purpose for tongues. And for example, I'm just going to touch on these briefly. Uh, of course, tongues is the initial sign of the spirit indwelling of the spirit baptism. We will learn that through Acts 2 and 8 and, and 10 and 19. Uh, certainly, as I mentioned already, uh, they're speaking in tongues in a personal private prayer setting that Paul describes as edification and communion with God. And connected to that, he talks about praying in the spirit with thanksgiving and praising in the spirit. And that all involves speaking with tongues. Again, that's Acts one, uh, or 1 Corinthians 14. But also that kind of highlights what was taking place in Acts 2 and Acts 10 as they were magnifying God, that praise and thanksgiving giving that comes through prayer uh, as we're speaking in tongues. And then also mention Romans 8, the Spirit making intercession for us. Again, a connected concept, but a little diversity of purpose uh, and, and the utilization of tongues and God's uh, will and plan. And then something I haven't even talked about, which we don't have time to get into, but talks about tongue being a sign for unbelievers in 1 Corinthians 14. In other words, not necessarily and not as a transmission of a message or a gospel, uh, but as a sign or a wonder or a miracle that accompanies uh, the 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 preaching and accompanies uh, Christian worship so that uh, that the unbelievers may understand the validity and the veracity of the message and uh, that's being uh, given so it's an accompanying sign for unbelievers uh, James the uh, in, in the epistle of James chapter number three discussing uh, the tongue uh, being impossible to ta tame in other words our words uh, that we say uh, being very hard to control. So we kind of speculate and infer from that that God possibly uses speaking in tongues as a sign that we have yielded control to him, both as an initial sign or evidence of the Spirit and an ongoing uh, uh, validation uh, when we pray that we are, are appropriately yielding ourself to God. And again, the, the Bible doesn't teach that directly, but it's certainly a potential purpose that God has for speaking in tongues. And certainly as a prophetic speaking communication gift, which is the subject of 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, which we've barely touched on. We've just touched on the exceptions and the distinction Paul made, uh, but you can go into a great deal of detail on his teaching of the spiritual gifts and speaking in tongues in a way that is to be interpreted for the edification 
for the building up of the church. The point then is that speaking in tongues is not a monolithic, limited, narrow experience that the critics and the skeptics would like us to believe, but it's an active uh, activity in the church that comes through prayer for a variety of different purposes and reasons, and many uh, millions of people can attest it's alive and well in the church today. In fact, a quarter of all Christians who uh, today, of all different types of denominations and, and understandings and theological backgrounds, uh, consider themselves to be Pentecostal or charismatic, charismatic, with the specific understanding and the unifying idea behind that of being speaking in tongues as a uh, expression of prayer and an experience that believers have today. A quarter of all Christians alive today. It's not the cultic practice that someone would like you to believe it is, but it's alive and well today. So to summarize this response, tongues is still in operation today. We're still in the same church age that the apostles were in. That's clear from scripture. The purpose of tongues was not to transmit, transmit the gospels to other language. It was simply an expression of their prayers and manifested as magnif magnifying and praising God, both on the day of Pentecost and every other time. And we know Peter spoke in one language that everyone understood uh, later in Acts chapter 2, so it was not necessary for tongues to be used to, to preach the gospel or some uh, other misunderstanding. The apostles and disciples at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 may or may not have been speaking in human languages. They may have been speaking in angelic languages or, or un, unknown, unintelligible languages utterances and, and sounds similar to the way that is commonly expressed and manifest today. Uh, I tend to lean that they were probably speaking the, the latter and the unintelligible, unknowable uh, uh, sounds just as we do today. But either way, even if that's not the case on the day of Pentecost, even if they were speaking in human languages, Pentecostals are on solid ground biblically because there are many other biblical precedents uh, that reflect the exact expression and manner that we experience today. And now I didn't even mention the fact that there's numerous accounts uh, of when um, worship and praise and prayer is going forward that people have uh, documented that people have spoken in other languages that uh, that were understood and known, including on recordings that have been given and that sort of thing. I don't think that happens frequently or it's the it's the primary manifestation or expression of speaking in tongues, but it certainly has happened and does happen at some times. So whatever the case may be. Paul differentiated between prayer in tongues, personal communication, edification, and utilizing tongues as a spiritual gift in public worship. He's saying they're two different things. We should understand them as two different things. And tongues is not the monolithic experience with a single expression and purpose that some try to describe, but rather God uses tongues in a number of different ways and for a variety of different purposes, uh, even still in the church today. And that's why we often talk about praying through in the spirit, you know, praying through until you are completely yielded to God in which God is actually speaking through you. And again, millions upon millions still experience that uh, in the church uh, across the world today. So thank you for the question. I think it was Mike uh, who sent the question. It was a great question and one I had fun addressing. Also, don't want, I want to remind you, those who are interested in this topic, again, there's a whole other episode that goes into many other different facets of this uh, topic of speaking in tongues as a sign of the Spirit. And I, uh, I answer seven different objections or criticisms that people have of the apostolic Pentecostal view of speaking in tongues. And so if you're interested in that, check out Bible FAQ with Kirk Van podcast episode number 13. Again, you can get that on the website, kirkvan.com, and also all the other different access methods that you can learn about when you go to the website. Well, that's all the time I'm going to take for today. Once again, I'm so thankful and glad for all of you who tuned in to this episode today. So until next time, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee 
and give thee peace. Have a great day. Farewell for now.